Johnny presents the Milton Berle Show. Make no mistake, of all leading cigarettes, the superiority of Philip Morris, and only Philip Morris, is recognized by eminent nose and throat specialists. No other cigarette can make that statement. So take a tip from Johnny and... From Radio City in New York, here is the Milton Berle Show with Pert Kelton, Jack Albertson, Johnny Gibson, Mary Ship, Billy Sands, Charlie Irving, Ruth Gilbert, our singing star Dick Barney, Ray Block and his orchestra, and yours truly, Frank Gallup. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we salute the communications industry. 72 years ago this week, to a world that had nothing, Alexander Graham Bell gave the telephone. The telephone gave us radio, radio gave us Milton Berle, and Milton Berle brings us right back to nothing. <laughs> and here he is, Milton Berle. Thank you. Hi, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Gallup, I- I'm, I'm a nothing? Are you kidding? Oh, man, I'm doing great. This is my comeback. I'm making a comeback from the place everybody keeps telling me to go to. <laughs> But you're right, Mr. Gallup. What an anniversary week it's been for inventions. And what a tough lives. What tough lives those inventors led. They laughed at Edison. They laughed at Bell. They laughed at Marconi. Then you came along and everybody stopped laughing. (laughs) You nearly didn't get one on that yourself. Mr. Gallup, uh, (laughs) I want you to watch that tonight. Because when you criticize this program, you're biting off your own nose. And with that nose, you'd have to be a sword swallower. (laughs) Get a load of that gallop. Really, it looks good? Really. What slab did you leave? <laughs> Every other program has nice, fat, jolly announcers. We have the only announcer in radio who gets valentines from undertakers. <laughs> but let's get on to more important things. Last Thursday was Lincoln's birthday, and what a week for the Republicans. Yes, the Republicans had their big Lincoln's Day dinner in Washington. I was there. Mm-hmm. And what a dinner. They only had one course. Roast Truman. <laughs> You notice the Republicans laugh. (laughs) But the Republican candidates are really campaigning. Dewey just got back from Boston. I don't say Dewey is overdoing his campaigning. But when he got off the plane, two babies fell out of his mustache. (laughs) Call a writer. (laughs) Call for a new writer. But the big event, Mr. Gallup, in New York this week was the dog show that was held at Madison Square Garden. The winning dog belonged to a Broadway columnist. Really, it was a half peak and half bull. <laughs> did you... Are you with me? <laughs> did, you, uh, did you attend the dog show, Mr. Gallup? Well, it so happens, Burl, that this year my dog was entered in the dog show. Your dog? Mm-hmm, my Great Dane, champion Gustav von Inverclyde, Duke of Auchinleck III. Gustav von Invencl... That's his name? Yes, but we call him Milton. (laughs) Well, that's sweet of you, Mr. Gallup. Is he a valuable dog? Valuable? Is he? He's worth over $25,000. $25,000? That's more than I'm worth. Well, some dogs are worth more than others. (laughs) Gee, that was jazzy. Mr. Gallup, the next time that your dog drags you into the backyard to bury you, take that joke with you. (laughs) And while you're there, get a writer. (laughs) But let us (laughs) continue... Oh, murder. But let us continue tonight as we salute communications. First, the telephone. The coming of the telephone brought with it new problems in the home between man and wife. The phone rings. Who will go to answer it? This is what we mean. Milton, answer the phone. Answer it? Don't be silly. It's not for me. They're always for you. No, this one is for you. I have a feeling. I have a feeling. I have a feeling. (laughs) I'm not expecting a call. I'm not expecting a call. I'm not expecting a call. (laughs) Answer it. Oh, all right. All right. I'll go. Hello? 
Yes? How do you like that? One moment, please. Well, Milton? You were right, dear. It's for me. I'll go back and see what they want. The telephone brought a new rich humor to American life. The practical joker. It is four in the morning. Milton Burl is sound asleep. Hey, Youngman steals all my jokes. <laughs> Bob Hope. He ain't nothing. I gotta get new writers. Milton, wake up. I do. What? Who deals? <laughs> oh, what is it? Milton, get up and answer the phone. All right. Gee, it's pitch dark. I don't know. Ow, 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 ow. My toe, my toe. <laughs> I broke my toe. So what? You still have 11 left. <laughs> Very funny. What's that? Oh, oh, oh. My back. Yeah. My neck. <laughs> it's dark. What am I stepping on? <laughs> what did you say, dear? Oh, 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 it was the cat. Where's the phone? Oh, brother, four in the morning. Must be important. Hello? Hello, Milton Merrill. Yes. Is your house on the streetcar track? Yes, it is. Better get it off. There's a streetcar coming. <laughs> Why, that... Who was it, Milton? Some practical joker. Said we should get our house out of the way. A streetcar's coming. <laughs> a streetcar's coming. <laughs> He was right. Look out. Here it comes. Get out of the way. Help! 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 Ah, oh, yes. Ah, Mr. Gallup, the telephone. Remember those days of our youth when the telephone meant romance? Through the receiver, you heard sweet words from that one and only girl. And then sometimes in your dreary little room, you used to... All alone, I'm so all alone. There is no one else but you. All alone, by the telephone, waiting for a ring, a tingling. Thank you, Oscar. Ah, Cynthia. Golden memories of Cynthia. I remember that day we met Cynthia when I stepped into the phone booth. I didn't know you were living there. <laughs> and I can still remember your tinkling little laugh when I put a nickel in your ear and tried to dial your face. <laughs> that love, your beautiful eyes. One eye said, come hither, and the other eye came over to meet it. <laughs> Cynthia, my little model. Oh, you are lovely. Remember those ads? You were during. <laughs> works on you, then you get to hate it, that joke. <laughs> Temperamental, Cynthia. How you used to blow off steam right through the hole in your head. <laughs> Patriotic, Cynthia. Remember that day that you called Washington? It was at Valley Forge and you asked him for a new uniform. You asked him for a new uniform. <laughs> <laughs> Home-loving, Cynthia. Every Saturday night you used to call your folks in Texas. How I pleaded with you to use a telephone and save your voice. <laughs> What a deep voice you had, Cynthia. Every time you yelled for a taxi, ships would stay out of New York Harbor. <laughs> That's why I'm all alone and I'll keep wondering how you are and where you are and if you are and what you are and who you are and there you are and oysters are and caviar and halibut. Wait a minute! 
I better quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> and wondering if you are all alone at home. Ladies and gentlemen, enough words have been written about cigarette and smoking pleasure to fill every library from here to Timbuktu. But you'll never hear words that make more sense, words that are more important to you who smoke than the words you're about to hear now. For these words were written by one of America's top-ranking doctors. Listen to what the doctor has to say. In cases of irritation of the nose or throat, it is my usual practice with my patients who smoke to suggest that they change to Philip Morris. And why does the doctor advise this change to Philip Morris? Listen. The reason for this advice is that I am convinced that they are less irritating than other cigarettes. Remember, if your cigarette leaves your throat dry and parched, if it makes you cough or leaves a stale, musty taste in your mouth, these definitely are reasons for a change to Philip Morris. So join up with the thousands who every day are discovering in Philip Morris a cleaner, fresher, milder smoke, a deeper, richer smoking pleasure than they've ever known before. Yes, call for Philip Morris. And remember, of all leading cigarettes, the superiority of Philip Morris and only Philip Morris is recognized by eminent nose and throat specialists. No other cigarette can make that statement. That's the finish? <laughs> that was Ray Block and the Philip Morris Orchestra playing two short polka. <laughs> I'm just a spoof and razy wazy. To me, your music is like the new look. It drags. And now. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> the boy in the second row, are you a writer? <laughs> See you after the show. Ladies and gentlemen, now as we continue our salute to the world of communications, we present. Radio Forum tonight. Radio Forum tonight. The question. If television is still in its infancy, will Milton Berle's face make it age overnight? Thank you, Mr. Gallup. Then let's have some questions from the audience. All right, let's start with this gentleman in the aisle with the exterminator spraying his wife. Uh, yes, sir? Mr. Burl, my three children were thin and anemic. But now, thanks to you, they have tremendous appetites. Really? How come? I just tell them if they don't eat, they have to listen to your program. Thank you, Henry Morgan. Let us continue. All right, this... Uh... This young man in the third row with the snakeskin hat and face to match. Um, young boy, stepping up here. Young man, uh, what is your name? My name is Winthrop Rockefeller. <laughs> Winthrop Rockefeller? Don't confuse me with the one that just got married. Oh, I won't. I'm the one that's got money. <laughs> you've, uh, you've got money? I'm loaded. You are. You're loaded. Yeah, whenever I say I'm loaded, I got money. <laughs> whenever you say you're loaded, you got money? No, whenever you're loaded, you say you have money. I see don't, what uh, you're... don't read it that way, son. <laughs> got a tack with he drove over in a Studebaker tonight. You see. <laughs> and uh, you haven't got money? Is, is, what's, is it very confusing to you? Well, yeah, we keep getting each other's mail. Who? <laughs> Who? Winthrop Rockefeller Winthrop Rockefeller And you keep Well, that's all right All right, Bobo You, uh You <laughs> Oh, it'd be funny if this is an audition And we don't know it. You, uh You have a question that concerns Is something about radio You must be kidding with a question like that No, I, I... You mean to stand there with your hoop hanging out and ask me that? Now, look... Why don't you just play it smart and shut up so maybe they won't notice you? But I thought... You want to know what's wrong with radio? I'll tell you, stupid. You don't... The trouble is you can reach millions of people, but nobody can get hold of you. No, I'm the not... The trouble is nobody can tell if you're funny or if your mother is yakking it up in the studio. Hey, your mother's Philco. <laughs> That uh, young man will take his three-year notice. <laughs> we, we must not create a disturbance. Let us go on to the ladies in the audience. All right, this lady in the last row with the dazed expression and the tire marks on her face. <laughs> uh, what is your name, madam? Tallulah Feeney. I'm a homemaker. I see. And you're a radio fan? Not me, my husband. Your husband? You hate a Dr. IQ? Yeah? She's Dr. P.U. <laughs> 
I see. You hate a queen for a day? Yes. He's small for a year. I understand. Does your husband attend many broadcasts? Once he went on Truth or Consequences. They put him in a tub full of whipped cream and then give him a calf's tongue to lick himself clean. No kidding. They carried that fat slob home, all covered with whipped cream. I thought he was a refrigerator, so I plugged him in the wall. You plugged him in the wall? Yeah, but it didn't work. He's AC in our building's DC. That's terrible. And Mrs. Feeney, tell me, what happened? His nose lit up and toast kept popping out of his vest. I see. Does he still attend broadcast? Not after what happened to him on Take It or Leave It. Take It or Leave It? He tried to take it, but they caught him and made him leave it. Thank you very much, Mrs. Feeney. Thank you. As a fitting climax to our forum on communications, it is an honor to present a man who, through sleet and storm, keeps your telephone lines open. He is none other than the telephone company's ace line man and troubleshooter, the hardiest and burliest of that two-fisted profession, Mac Boomer Featherfield. Mr. Featherfield, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Barrel. <laughs> It is glorious occasions like this that makes my heart overflow with gratitude to the thousands of people who've seen me sliding down telephone poles and getting slivers all over the United States and certain parts of the South. I must say, Mr. Featherfield, for a man in your rugged profession, you don't look too well. I know. It was that terrible scare I got this morning. Scare? What happened? I saw two vultures fighting on my front lawn. Why did that scare you? They were fighting over me. (laughs) Mr. Featherfield, up on those poles tapping the telephone wires all day, you must hear some very choice bits of uh, conversation. Ooh. Ha! I had the most frightening experience a married man can have. You did? Well, what happened? I was fixing a telephone line near my house. Yeah? And I heard a man in a deep voice say to a woman, Sweetheart, pack your trunk and leave your husband. And when I heard the woman say yes, I cried like a baby. No, because it was your wife? No, because it wasn't. (laughs) How did you meet your wife? I was on a hunting trip. I blew my moose call, and there she was. And your marriage has been a very happy one? She keeps sweeping me off my feet. She keeps sweeping you off the feet? Whenever I'm working high up on a pole, she comes by on her broom. Where were you married? Well, my wife's a Michigan girl, so we had a Battle Creek wedding. A, a Battle Creek wedding? Yeah. She's been battling, and I've been up the creek ever since. Thank you very much, Mr. Featherfield. Now, here's our young singing star, Dick Barney, to sing Beg Your Pardon. If I lose my head, beg your pardon For things that I've said, beg your pardon Why should I worry the way that I do When you're in a hurry to let me love you I'll try for a kiss in the garden And if I should miss, beg your pardon But if some sunny day you let me have my way I won't have to say beg your pardon Beg your pardon Beg your pardon Why should I worry the way that I do When you're in a hurry to let me love you I'll try for a kiss in the garden And if I should miss, beg your pardon But if some sunny day you let me have my way I won't have to say 
Beg your pardon. Wonderful. Wonderful, Dick Carney. You know, Mr. Gallup, did you know that I was a boy soprano? Didn't you know that? Then came that awful day when I was 32. My voice changed. It went higher. (laughs) The doctors diagnosed... uh, Diagnosed... Don't go away. (laughs) They diagnosed it as a large, overacted, uh, active... What's your line, old boy? <laughs> I'm getting mixed up. We're talking about something different, and we should be talking about the communications tonight. Exactly, and precisely and specifically the telephone. Oh, the telephone, yes. yes. <laughs> this boy is due back in Gimbel's window in the morning. Uh, uh, yes, it is true. We're talking true. about communications, and it reminds me, it says here, just this week... <laughs> Something happened to me, Mr. Gallup, in regard to telephones that I must tell you about. And shall I? I hope the folks that are listening in are laughing as much as we are on the stage. It was last Thursday, speaking of telephones, it was, I mean, last Saturday, and the... It was last Saturday, and I had just finished lunch in a drugstore here in Radio City. Um... Here's your change, Mr. Burrow. Thank you very much. Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, thanks. That's right. Today is Valentine's Day. Do. And I forgot to send my wife a Valentine. I know. I'll call her up and personally wish her a happy Valentine. Here's a phone bill. She's so sensitive about holidays, too. Lincoln's birthday, she got mad because uh, I didn't send him a gift. (laughs) Gee, what'll I say? Long distance, who are you calling? Mabel, circle six, two... Wait a minute. (laughs) What am I reading here off the wall? (laughs) Operator. I'm sorry, Operator. I get a little mixed up. I'm so nervous. I'm Milton Burrow, and I'm calling my home in Jackson Heights. The number is Jamaica 5600. Yes, sir. Deposit 35 cents, please. Let's see. That's three dimes and a nickel, isn't it? I'm sorry. We do not give out that information. (laughs) Okay, okay. Here's the money. See, when my wife answers, I'll I'll just say, I love you with a heart divine. Will you be my valentine? Mm, Pretty good. I must have read that in Nick Kenny's column. (laughs) Boy, it's getting hot in here. Operator. 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 What's with that Jackson Heights call? Sorry, sir. There's no Milton Squirrel listed for that number. Squirrel? Did you did you say squirrel? Shall I try Central Park? <laughs> no, no, stop kidding. The joke's over. Just get the number. Whom are you calling, sir? Whom am I? Mrs. Milton Burrow. I'm Milton. This is Milton. Milton? Milton, Massachusetts. <laughs> go ahead, New York. Oh, brother. Look, miss, I just want Jackson... Well, you'll have to deposit two dollars and forty cents, sir. But, but I... Okay, let me see. How many coins is two dollars? I'm sorry, we do not give out that information. I know, it must be the formula for the atom bomb. All right, here's the dough. Now get me Jackson Heights, Mrs. Milton Burrow. Burrow. B as in Baltimore, E as in elephant, R as in rose, E as in making another elephant. Now get with it, please, and get the floor. <laughs> Operator. Operator. This is Los Angeles. No, no. Sorry, sir. We cannot locate a Milton Burrow here in Los Angeles. (laughs) That's funny. He told me he was going to be there. Shall I switch you back to Baltimore? No, please. Not again. Switch me back to New York. Thank you. New York. Number, please. (laughs) Hello, New York. Hello. Still snowing? I'm sorry. We do, do not give out any information. I know. <laughs> now, look, for two hours, I've been trying to get my wife in Jackson Heights. I'm Milton Burrow. By this time, you can call me Milty. Okay, Milty, deposit 35 cents, please. <laughs> Another 30? Oh, all right. Here. I just want to say happy Valentine. But I want to say it today, not Labor Day. Hurry up, please. You're calling me. Abbevalian. How about that call? We're ready, sir. Good. We finally located Mr. Milton Burrow for you, sir. You've located him? He's in a phone booth in the drugstore at Radio City. Oh, he is. <laughs> That's 
funny. I just left him in Los Angeles. <laughs> now, look, Gary. Just get Mrs. Milton Burl in Jackson Heights. Yes, sir. Mrs. Merle Hilton in Jacksonville. <laughs> Not Merle. Wait, I give up. Look, call Jamaica, 6000. That's my next-door neighbors, Sam Harrison and his wife, Martha. I'll tell them to dig a tunnel through the snow to my house and bring my wife to the phone. The Harrisons. Yes, sir. Here is your party. Hello? Yes. Is, is, is this the Harrisons? Yes. Is, is that you, Martha? Yes. Is Sam there? Yes. Martha, will you do me a favor? Yes. Would you call Sam to the phone? Yes. Thank you. Oh, that Martha, when she gets on the phone, you can't get her off. Hi, Melvin. <laughs> Sam. <laughs> Sam, would you listen closely? I'm desperate. Well, what is it, Milty? Listen, Sam, I want you to go to, over to my... Three minutes are up, sir. Wait a minute. Number, please. Operator, please. I was disconnected. Switch me back. One moment, sir. One moment. Take your time. I don't want to rush you. I don't want to rush you. Rush you? Yes, sir. Wait a minute. <laughs> Go ahead, No, no. Please get me somebody who can understand English. English? Da. This is London, England. Cheerio. Cheerio. Look, would you please? You hold the four pounds, old thing. Four pounds? <laughs> I've already lost ten pounds in this boot. I'm broke. The sorry old fruit deposited the money and the whole thing's off, you know. I won't pay. You can deduct it from the loan. <laughs> oh, I say that's not cricket, old crumpet. Oh, look, please. I don't want to play crumpet, old cricket. I mean, look, get me back to New York. I just want to say happy crumpet to my crick. I mean, I want to say happy bath. I, I want to say... Operator. <laughs> Operator. It's three in the morning. Be patient, sir. We're trying to reach Mrs. Milton Graziano in Mexico City. Mexico? Operator, do you know what time it is? When you hear the tone, the time will be exactly. Operator, please, look. Let's try it this way. Blindfold your eyes. Yes, sir. And just plug in anything in front of you. Yes, sir. This is Jackson Hyatt. I knew it would work. I have Mrs. Milton Burl on the line. Mrs. Milton Burl? I can't believe it. Quick, I want to speak to her. I'm sorry, sir. She doesn't want to speak to you. She, she, she don't want to... Mrs. Burl says... Please, she don't want to speak to me. Mrs. Burl says any man who won't take two minutes to phone his wife on Valentine's Day isn't worth living with. Two minutes? <laughs> Let me talk to her. She just hung up. She's leaving for her mother. No, no. My wife is leaving. What am I going to do without a wife? I'm sorry. We do not give out that information. I just wanted to say happy information. Oh, this is so... Remember this, there's a difference in Philip Morris, an advantage that distinguishes it from any other leading brand. And to you, that difference means a cleaner smoke, a fresher, milder smoke, from your first Philip Morris in the morning to your last one at night. Remember, of all leading cigarettes, the superiority of Philip Morris and only Philip Morris is recognized by eminent nose and throat specialists. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. <laughs> <laughs> 